Joining me today on the show is Adrian Movat, Chief Asian and Emerging Equity Strategist at JP Morgan. Thanks very much, Adrian. It's always a pleasure talking to you. My first question, referring to a more recent report uh, that you and your colleagues have written, which is headlined, Don't Fight the Bank of Japan or Fed or ECB. Could you explain that a bit? Yes, we've got extraordinary monetary policy at this point in time. Uh, and I think despite the oscillations that we've seen in particularly the Japanese government bond market, we have a lot more QE today than we had a few months ago. So the governor Kuroda announced in early April that they would be buying something like the equivalent of 1.6 times net issuance. Uh, the important thing to understand here is the determination of central bankers in the United States, Europe, and now in Japan to generate growth, and in specifically in Japan, to generate some inflation. And all the policymakers in Japan are lined up to go for this target of 2% CPI. In that type of environment, I think you are going to continue to get this ongoing appreciation of assets, such as equities in the developed world, but it's very much a developed world story. We saw that sharp fall uh, in Japan uh, you know, a few days ago, Adrian, and it almost, uh, not almost, actually, the Indian finance minister had to come out and give a statement saying that the comments of the U.S. Fed had not been understood well, uh, and therefore there was no concern in any way that that uh, entire easing or the liquidity could get affected. Would you agree with that? Well, I agree with what Mr. Chidandaram was saying. Um, I think there's a lot of uh, poor quality language used around describing what's going on at the moment with regards to central bank policy. Um, let's be clear, we have zero interest rates for the foreseeable future. Uh, the Fed has got very clear communication on this. Uh, they will keep zero interest rate policy until unemployment falls below 6.5%. So that's what's happening at the short end. At the longer end, then I think that's perhaps where the ambiguity comes in. But again, just pay attention to what the central banks are saying. The central bank is saying that they will use quantitative easing when the economy needs it. And as the economy re uh, recovers, the amount of quantitative easing will be moderated. Uh, and so we have this uh, idea of the tapering of quantitative easing. What is quantitative easing? This is the use of the central bank's balance sheet to acquire assets such as uh, U.S. treasuries as well as, uh, well as mortgage-backed securities. In our view, this may start to happen in December this year where we would see a reduction in the amount of purchases. It would be a very moderate change rather than a step change. So that does make it different from the previous periods of quantitative easing. So we need to, when talking about interest rates, we need to be very clear about whether we're talking about the long end or the short end. Why did we get so much volatility recently in the Japanese government bond market? Well, this was a sort of interesting story of market positioning. People assumed that because the Bank of Japan was going to buy so many uh, Japanese government bonds, that bond yields had to fall, that bonds would continue to rally. Well, that's a flow uh, analysis. It does not consider the stock of debt. It does not consider the fact that savers in Japan for 20 years have been long Japanese government bonds because the environment is deflationary. Now the risk is to those savers that you're going to get an expansion in the Japanese economy, that they are going to defeat deflation. And if that's the case, you don't want to own Japanese government bonds. You want to own real estate. You want to own the stock market. You want to go out there and start investing if you're a company. So we've seen selling by the investors, uh, even though the Bank of Japan is buying, and that's why yields have moved up. It's a sign of success of QQE, as they call it in Japan. It is not a sign of failure. But market positioning was all one way, and that will generate volatility and ironically cause an Indian finance minister to have to comment on the Japanese government bond market, causing a sell-off in an equity market that had risen 45% year to date. Is it your view, therefore, Adrian, that uh, we will for some time at least continue to see the kind of portfolio inflows we are seeing here in India and some other emerging markets? Yes, I think you will continue to see inflows into equities. Uh, we're seeing more of an inflow into developed market equities uh, relative to emerging market equities. Uh, 
What we're also seeing in emerging market equities is that passive products such as ETFs are seeing outflows. Yesterday, there was significant outflows, something like a billion dollars out of EM ETFs. I think that's because the EM index is going nowhere. Well, it's actually down a little bit year to date. So if you want EM exposure, that needs to be in actively managed funds, not in passive funds. So yes, I think there'll still be inflows, but remember, developed markets are getting more than emerging. You've written in the same note about the benefit from cheaper oil, and you've talked about Thailand, Korea, and India, the biggest beneficiaries. What is your sense that this entire commodity uh, fall that we've seen, do you see it sustaining for some more time, Adrian? Yes, I think the current environment is extremely bearish for commodities. Before we talk about China, we need to talk about the United States and Europe. Uh, these places have large fiscal imbalances. They are reducing their fiscal deficit. That is pushing their growth well below trend. We are not seeing in the surplus countries a corresponding expansion in policy. So we have global growth well below trend. That is a bearish backdrop. You add to that Chinese economic data, which is uh, disappointing consensus. You know, we've had the market uh, PMI numbers out earlier on this week, again below 50. Uh, I think the current environment is profoundly bearish for commodities, and I think you could also throw energy into that complex. Would that be one of the reasons you're overweight India at this point of time? And just to put things into perspective, we've had, uh, perhaps, we've been the uh, recipient of uh, among the largest amount of foreign inflows, but yet in terms of the market level or the returns, we've had a fairly tepid year so far. Uh, how, how does India look to you, Adrian? Well, let me take that at two different levels. If we talk about flows, uh, when foreigners are net buyers, I often ask, why are locals net sellers? Um, and there have been issues, particularly we've seen ongoing redemptions in insurance products that are related to the equity market. Um, and I think also savers have had alternatives, uh, such as reasonably high deposit rates. Uh, but looking forward, I would argue that India has one of the strongest improvements in its fundamentals. The current situation in India is a weak economy, poor profits. Uh, global expectations of India are actually quite low, particularly on the policy front. Uh, I think that investors are missing the story. We have had a reduction in the fiscal deficit. Part of that is structural with the reduction in the subsidy of diesel. Uh, we're entering that sweet spot. We had a period of time where Indian growth was poor and inflation was high. Now that poor growth is translating into less inflation. So the central bank has a lot of flexibility to cut rates. I think the French central bank rhetoric will remain hawkish because they need to keep disciplining the government uh, to keep the fiscal deficit under control. But I think you'll see the RBI cutting rates further. And so as an equity investor that looks forward uh, 12 months, I think India will be feeling a lot better in 12 months' time, and the central bank's giving me a lower discount rate.